This might be my earliest memory. I'm two years old. I'm being carried by my mother. She's holding a lit torch, like Indiana Jones style. And about 10 feet in front of us in the back of a flatbed truck, my grandmother is lying peacefully. She recently passed away after a long, painful, and arduous bout with cancer. And today is the day of her cremation. Cremation is how Hindus say goodbye to the world, or at least how their bodies traditionally say goodbye to the world. The energy of the spirit moves, is reincarnated and repurposed into a new body or, or a new life. And what's left behind is just matter. And we put them on uh, funeral pyres and we, um, we light them up. And I don't even think we keep the ashes. Uh, as you can tell from my <laughs> the questioning in my voice, I'm not a practicing Hindu. But culturally, it's a fabric of my life. And so when I die, up until recently, I really just thought, light the match, burn the evidence, and I'll see you later. It seems like there's only two sanitary options when it comes to dealing with a dead body. You either get cremated or you're pumped full of embalming fluids, caked in makeup, and then you're put in a casket six feet under. But there's got to be more options. I'm Woodkar Shambudkar, and this is Close to Death. In this series, I'm talking to writers, journalists, and comedians who've all spent time with people who work in the death industry. Today, journalist and comedian Francesca Fiorentini is helping us get rid of a dead body. You might know her from Newsbroke on AJ+, or maybe you've seen her doing stand-up in L.A. Francesca isn't impressed by the norm core burial options we've got, so she's looking for a fresh way of disposing of a fresh body. I'm excited to see what's out there. But it's kind of hard to know where to start. So I started with who I know, my mom, who's beginning to think about what she wants to happen to her body when she dies. Now, she's what you might call a young 80. She still drives to the farmer's market and not into the farmer's market, which is good. And she's bringing that farmer's market vibe into planning for the end of her life, too, She recently told me that she'd like to skip the crematorium and the graveyard and just be buried in nature. She wants to become a tree. It's a lovely idea, but how do you bury someone in the woods when you're not in the mafia? I'm a good daughter, so I started looking into green cemeteries where you can bury someone right in the dirt. There are about 150 green cemeteries across the country, and I went to check one out in Washington state. I followed the map up the Columbia River from Portland, far up a mountainside. I got lost, but I finally found it. Herland Forest, one part farm, one part forest, an all eternal resting place. The farm's got gardens full of plants and fields full of goats, pigs, chickens, sheep. There were all sorts of baby animals. It was kind of like something out of a Disney movie. My mom would love it. The forest was basically scraggly trees surrounded by large mounds of dirt. It was also like something out of a Disney movie, the part where things get dark and spooky. This is a completed grave. Okay. Uh, The person loved plums. And so they have their own personal plum tree. We put in the daffodils because that keeps the ground squirrels out. I'd I'd have a skunk probably come to my grave. That'd be my luck. Some of the graves had wooden headstones. Some had stone headstones. Some had flowers planted, and others had saplings just beginning to grow above the body of a former person. There are about 60 bodies currently buried at Herland. So I guess my mom is onto a trend, which would be a first. You have one death and make it uh, manifest your deeper values. What a powerful and trans say in, in face of, of that, that permanent, irrevocable change to say, yes, I'm going to do it in a way that's consistent with my values. Mm. You only have one death. 
and, and to get it done the way you want it. Literally never heard that phrase. Yeah. I've only heard one life to live, not one death to die. Yeah. Walt Patrick is a big values guy. His dad was a Navy chaplain, so he's been around death most of his life. Walt's lived at Herland for 34 years. He loves living here so much, he wants to die here too. And he wants to stay here when he's dead. It's Walt's death wish that really put life into this whole thing. I grew up uh, a Navy kid. Yeah. And so traveling all around, you know. And when I found this place, I connected and said, this is my forever home. So I wanted to be buried here. I didn't want to leave. So in Washington State, you have to be buried in a licensed cemetery. Okay, fine. So we'll dedicate part of our land as a cemetery. I don't know that I've ever been as attached to a place as Walt is to Herland, but I guess when you've spent the first half of your life traveling, finding a spot where you want to put down roots is a big deal. There's a few things Green Burial does differently. First, it's green. Duh. There's none of the inorganic accoutrement that are part of a normal mainstream burial. Natural burial is generally about what you don't do i.e. you don't embalm, Mm. you don't build a coffin, you don't have a concrete vault over the body. Connecting, reconnecting the body, the person to life, Mm. instead of simply isolating it. When you think about what they do in normal burial, you put the body in a box, you put the body in just a dry dirt hole and put a concrete block on it. It's all about isolation. Here at Walt's place, you're going straight into the earth, still fresh from death. And doing it Walt's way isn't just greener than the silk-lined casket route. It's greener than cremations, too. Every year, cremations in the U.S. produce about 360,000 metric tons of carbon. You know, the greenhouse gas that's warming up the planet. With green burial, on the other hand, your body can actually feed the trees, just like my mother wanted. Walt told me, even when there's no person inside the body, there's tons of leftover life. The minerals that the body brings back to the forest are essential to supporting further growth and development of the forest. Magnesium and phosphorus and calcium and potassium and boron and a whole variety of things in us that are needful. To Walt, you and I are vessels of needful minerals. But people don't just feed the trees by getting buried here. They are literally putting their bodies on the line for the forest. Dead people protect the spot they're buried in from clear-cutting or development, since in the U.S., you can't legally put a condo over a cadaver. In Walt's cemetery, family members don't leave cut flowers to shrivel up in the sun. They can plant things right on top of the grave. There aren't limited visiting hours either. This is a whole-ass campsite. So, if my mom were buried here, I could camp next to her Japanese maple tree. Then we could have a picnic and try not to think about sitting on the needful minerals that were once my mother. So one of the things that surprised us is that over half of the people who are buried here are long-term married couples who want to go forward together, Mm -hmm. face this last journey as as a couple. Yeah, they have no commitment issues whatsoever. Yeah. And you can't do that in any cemetery unless the two people are die at the same time. You know, then you could put two people in a grave. Yes. But if they're dying at different times, what do you do? And so what we did, we created this double wide uh, grave, uh, enlarged grave, and we filled the whole thing full of wood chips. Mm -hmm. And then when Karen died, we went ahead and pulled the wood chips out put her body in up against the plywood. Okay. Fill the grave back in. And the plywood will keep her grave, the materials in her grave, from falling in to his grave as we try and excavate for his grave. I see. And then at the end, when he is, then, when and, he dies, we you lift the plywood? Then, yeah, and they're together. They couldn't even have a little bit of dirt separating. Right. Yeah, they wanted to be that close. They want their magnesium mm-hmm. touching the other's mm-hmm. magnesium. Mm-hmm. It's codependency. So basically, Walt's lover's option is like the California king of graves. And if your beloved dies before you, they'll keep your side of the bed warm until you're ready. (laughs) 
But planting people under plum trees isn't the only way that Walt's extracting needful minerals from bodies. He walks me over to another part of the farm where there's a large composting contraption. It's this wooden barrel lying on a rack. We use the term cradle because it's very much like uh, a baby's cradle uh, once upon a time. Walt recently became the first person in Washington state licensed to compost human bodies. That's what these spooly tumbler things are for. Let's be clear, they're not cradles, but they are in fact rocking. You have to tumble compost. Yes. Because compost needs to be oxygenated, etc. And the way you do that normally is with a shovel. In our case, it's a little bit different here. In composting, there's a ratio between nitrogen and carbon mm -hmm. that you need to have balanced out for the whole thing to work. As someone who just started their own backyard compost, oh, I'm granola like my mom, let me soil splain. See, there's got to be a good green to brown ratio in compost, say kitchen scraps to leaves or grass clippings. You have issues there in your compost pile yeah. about balancing out the amount of fat and meat and bones with other organic matter. Right. You, you can't just compost, you know, a, a turkey carcass. Yes. I mean, you can mix You got to put in. some coffee grinds in there. All kinds of, yeah. You, you need a whole variety of things. We're putting in 200 gallons of wood chips to go with the body to provide the, the moisture that you need for the, for the animals to do. Because otherwise, you're just making jerky. And she never ate jerky again. There's a real human body in the cradle Walt is showing me, plus some wood chips to keep it cooking. It's just the body, but the wood chips and the water. We inoculate it with uh, uh, composting bacteria we get from a, a company in British Columbia. And there are some valves and pressure valves, I see, or? Yep, those are access points for inspection. Okay, to look in? Yeah. Can yeah. we look in? Yeah. You're just gonna see wood chips. You're not gonna see anything. But you can look in if you want. When I peek inside, Walt's right. I can't see anything except for wood chips and some steam. I guess that means the process is working? Walt thinks so, maybe. Yes, probably. They're still figuring it out. We're a, we're a sustainability research facility. Everything we do is about gathering data and track line and information, et cetera, because nobody has done this before. This, right. is, this is novel stuff. And how does it work? And, and how do we optimize it without jeopardizing it? So this one's actually working. This is, you can see, it's, it's got the name of the person inside here. Uh, and so this, there's, there's a body in here. Wow. Yeah. I know that whoever's in here chose this, but it does feel a bit strange, just knowing that a former father, mother, ex-lover twice removed, their body is inside this barrel. Yeah, I want you to step up oh, on here. Oh man, this is gonna be, I'm gonna fall. Well, I want you to just, just reach up and hold this. Okay. Now, I'm go we're gonna push it forward and I'm gonna pull the chalk out and you're gonna see how easy it is to roll. Here it goes. Yeah. It's already rolling. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, man. So, Whoa. that's a ton. The wooden track system works pretty well, and the barrel rolls easily. But still, talk about disturbing the dead. This human compost will one day be used to fertilize the plants here. And not just Herland, but whichever garden, farm, or forest the person wanted to feed. Anyways, if I had to choose between the two options Walt's got on offer, I gotta say, I think I'd rather tree roots grow through my ribcage than roll around in this gizmo. I had to ask, does spending every waking hour with all these dead bodies around ever get to Walt? So one of the points is that how do we engage with death and maintain an, an emotional, psychological equilibrium? Yeah. And part of it is, is balanced out by working with the, the baby animals. So we can bring life out in the garden, bring life out with the animals, and get to balance it out so that emotionally, this is a sustainable uh, endeavor for us. Emotionally, you mean for yourself? Yeah. You have to balance it out. I keep thinking about what Walt said earlier. You only have one death. 
And alternative burials do seem like a way to make the most of being dead. It's like that sequel to the children's book, The Giving Tree, but way grosser. But really, humans do so many creative things with bodies once they're lifeless. I mean, we've had thousands of years to experiment, right? For instance, if you want a different way to support local wildlife, you could opt for a sky burial, where your body's left at the top of a mountain for vultures and bugs to eat. Can't decide between cremation and burial at sea? Make like a Viking and have your body set on fire on a raft that's headed out to the ocean. And I mean, if you're a big fan of Breaking Bad, you could dissolve yourself in a chemical bath. Or hey, if you're a Fargo head, there are wood chippers all across this great country. Let's not limit ourselves here. If you want to disrupt the funeral industrial complex, you've got options, man. And some of them are, like, actually out of this world. When you move in with someone you've been dating for a while, there's gonna be some surprises. Oren had been dating Bill for a couple of years, mostly long distance, before they moved in together. They were unpacking their boxes when they discovered they had something huge in common. He says, what's this? And he begins to see, you know, this drawings for the Enterprise, the Vulcan Science Academy certificate. Um, And then he opens his box and he has a model of the Enterprise. And we're like, you like Star Trek? No, you like Star Trek? First of all, Vulcan Academy got questions too. How, after all this time, you never talked about Star Trek? I mean, we were both interested in space. I mean, my undergrad was in theoretical mathematics. So, yeah, I'm somewhat of a geek. And he had wanted to be an astronaut to begin with. That's why I went to the Air Force Academy, right? Um, And was not accepted because they weren't accepting corrected vision. And Bill wore glasses. The year after they did start accepting (gasps) correct. I know. And that was always just something that he just, I don't think ever truly, truly got over. Um, But what turned out to be sort of a, a love, individual love of Star Trek became a mutual love. Or maybe more like mutual Trekkie enabling. There were online forums, conventions, cosplay, a wedding vow renewal ceremony officiated by a Starfleet admiral with Klingons present, and then a home renovation. The basement had not been finished. And so we decided to make the basement the Enterprise. Whoa. Okay. And I've never heard of anyone turning their basement into oh yeah. like an actual... A spaceship. Um, Well, I mean, we didn't expand our house to do it. But within the basement, um, we have a captain's quarters, right? All of the doors are the sliding red doors of the original series. The color scheme is all like metallic blues, etc. We have a galley and a sort of like rec area, right, where they would meet. And the three-dimension chess board was on the table. I found the furniture that was used in the original series, which was a Scandinavian designer. And so I had... Ikea. I've heard of it. No, it wasn't Ikea. I literally had... No, no but yes. <laughs> I'm joking. No, no, no. Of course it wasn't Ikea. <laughs> you know, in the galley, we had our microwave. We could eat down there. We'd sleep in the captain's quarters. We'd watch movies. Oh. You could spend a whole weekend there. It's like a getaway. Okay, I have to ask, um, any Trekkie role-playing in an intimate way? Anyone be the, was anyone Dax and the other one Worf? (laughs) What happens in the captain's quarters stays in the captain's quarters. Orin and Bill are couple goals. They were together for around 20 years. 20 years of conventions and enterprise upgrades and Star Trek repeats. 
But their love was cut short in 2017 when Bill died suddenly. I was in Madagascar on a business trip. And we talked with each other every night when I was traveling. He actually had taken himself to the hospital that evening after I talked with him because he wasn't feeling that good. Um, The next morning I get a call from a nurse saying, please come, your husband has passed. Wow. And I had just talked with him that night. Just like that? Just like that. Bill had just turned 60. And all I could think of was, I've got to do whatever I can for Bill. Bill's body was cremated. But Oren decided to do something out of this world with his ashes. And Charles Chafer was there to help her do it. I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, and there was nothing more important on the planet than going to the moon and space travel. They'd wheel in TVs in our uh, elementary school classes to watch rocket tests. So I'm I'm a bona fide space nut, space Mm -hmm. geek, have been all my life. Mm -hmm. But it also looked like a good business opportunity if you could combine low-cost access to space with the growing cremation rate. We were sort of uh, SpaceX before SpaceX. And Charles has been launching soulless people into space long before Jeff Bezos went there. Back in 1994, Charles started a business sending people into space on ships that are already heading up. According to his website, beginning at about $2,500 with flexible payment plans, your deceased loved one can hitch a ride out of this atmosphere. Um, I have a really stupid question. What if you just launched a cadaver into space? Like, what what would happen? So about the same thing that's happening to that dummy that Elon put in the Mar- in the Tesla <laughs> yeah. that he launched out to Mars. Over time, radiation in the environment pretty much just it it doesn't exist anymore. So that's pretty much what would happen. So you sort of like you disintegrate. It's mostly the radiation. The charged particles would just sort of make you go into multiple (laughs) pieces, small pieces. And just break apart. Yes. Charles's space memorial company, Celestis, sends ashes up to space on rockets with real astronauts. For today, let's call them (laughs) astronauts. Um, so... Are there urns that wear, like, cute little space suits and are, like, strapped in with seat belts and little helmets? How does it look? How are the the ashes sort of held in place? Think about a lipstick container as our largest um, size. And then a half a lipstick container and a quarter lipstick container. And that holds anywhere from one gram to seven grams. Okay, but in all seriousness, when you cremate someone, there is a lot of ash. That's why the vase on your aunt's mantelpiece is so big. It's not a vase. And seven grams is only a small fraction of what's left of someone after cremation. Which makes the flight sound mostly symbolic. You're absolutely right. It is symbolic, but it's also real. I mean, that's really them that's going, so... Uh, people uh, understand that, you know, uh, we're launching a portion of the remains of someone who was near and dear and that they loved on a permanent uh, journey Mm -hmm. to the moon or into Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's very real. In another sense, it's absolutely symbolic. Still, there's clearly a certain magic to watching a rocket launch knowing your loved one is on it. And people are into it. Seven grams of Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, was on Charles's first flight. Most of Bill's ashes were placed in a grave at Arlington Cemetery with all the usual pomp and circumstance. But there was also circumstance and pomp when Celestis sent some of Bill's ashes into outer space. 
Before liftoff, families and friends tour the launch site. They go to fancy group dinners and even hear from astronaut guest speakers. It's like this joint memorial for a bunch of space nerds and the people who loved them. And they're all together when it's time for the launch. Um, we are all grabbed up in buses and taken to a location which is across like a waterway, because you don't actually go, a waterway from where the launch is going to be. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had, it was like a pic, a night picnic. Um, and you can hear on your phone, like the countdowns and what's going on, et cetera. And then all of a sudden you see this, in, like the sun is rising. And then subsequently you feel the wave, right, of the rocket. Wow. As it's going up in space. It was incredible. And I knew that Bill was on it. Yeah. What do you think Bill would have said standing there watching that rocket take off? Uh, I think if he were there, he would have just held me and kissed me. I don't think he would have said anything. When you get to about 10 minutes pre-launch, everybody gets quiet. Because, of course, light travels faster than sound. So the first thing you see in the case of a night launch is night turns into day because (laughs) those rockets light up. And it's eerie because it's quiet. And off the rocket goes and then... A few, you know, half a minute later, the sound hits you. Wow. And it when I say hits you, it literally, you feel it as it goes through you and past you. Wow. And, uh, you know, that is all punctuated by uh, people, most of them not conscious of what they're doing, screaming and yelling and cheering and high-fiving and just go, 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 go. Would you want to take a flight after your life? Absolutely. I, I've told my staff and my loved ones, just fly me until you run out of me. <laughs> Sending Bill off into space, or at least part of him, meant a lot to Orin because she knew it'd mean a lot to Bill. And she likes knowing he's up there. He's circling the earth. And, you you know, I can, sometimes I'll go to Celeste's website to see where he is. Um, you can track him on the website. Correct. Wow. You can track the satellite on the website. Although I've ordered, they just started this thing where you can buy a piece of equipment. I don't even know. Don't ask me what the equipment is. And every time your loved one comes over, it will light up so you don't even have to go to the website. <laughs> you know that he's in rain somewhere. I got to say, there's something really sweet about looking up in the sky and thinking of your loved ones because they're actually in the sky. Orin and Bill have seen every episode of Star Trek at least twice. And like some couples have a favorite song, they had a favorite episode. It's a two-part episode, I believe. And it's this probe. They run across the probe in the ship. The probe takes over Jean-Luc Picard, the captain. And he wakes up in a completely different environment on a completely different planet. He lives a full life with a wife, with children, on this planet that is doomed. Mm. And the reason they sent out the probe was so that knowing that their civilization was going to die out because of a a, a a supernova, right? They wanted to make sure that someone remembered them. And so the probe having taken over Jean-Luc Picard, there would always be someone who remembered them. And we live in you. Tell me about 
tell them of us, my darling. I will always remember. I mean, I can't not remember him. I love Bill and Oren. It's amazing that she got to give him a send-off that he would have loved. But I'm not sure I'm up for space travel after death. I mean, I hate turbulence. Wow, Francesca, thank you for diving in. I got to say, now, I don't know if I would want to burn a loved one or be burned and then just be sort of carbon or matter that has no purpose as such. Because the idea of a grandchild or or a descendant, you know, sitting underneath my lemon tree, not lemons because they're spiky and you get bees and whatnot, some sort of tree that doesn't draw wasps and enjoying a good book. I mean, that could be really beautiful. And I'm getting shot up into space sounds cool too, but I'm a little dubious because I had bought a star once in space. And <laughs> they tell me that that star is in some quadrant of something and I see a picture of it, but there's too many variables at yeah. play. Yeah, no, I definitely, I get that. I mean, I think if space played a role in your life, I get wanting to go up there in your death and also, like, if you could put an actual dead body, like, if I could be an astronaut without having to be cremated, that is something I could get more into. Um, you mean if your dead body was shot into space, like, in a spacesuit? Yeah, or just kind of, like, accompanying the astronauts, you know, just kind of, like, as a as a homie, you know, just like, hey, yo, that's Francesca. Yeah, no, she doesn't say much. Um, okay, so it definitely sounds like you're going the space death route. Any other ideas? Like, you know, if... If we really break down the barriers between, you know, our fear of dead bodies, I would honestly like to be an installation at some, you know, uh, some haunted hayride. You just just like taxidermy me and like I could sit in the front next to the driver. And again, there there's Franny. Yeah, the head turns around. It would just be it'd be great, you know, and one day I hope children will be less afraid of dead bodies and we could get there. That is such a beautiful thing to aspire to. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. But yeah, I'm definitely still leaning towards Walt on this one. I will let you all know where you can visit my tree in the future. I can't wait. Is that weird to say I can't wait for your death so I can visit your tree? I mean, it's only weird if I'm not invited to your launch at Charles Place. I'm going to see you go to space. <laughs> If you want to turn yourself into fertilizer, Walt would love to help. You can learn more at herlandforest.org, or if you're looking to get as far away from Earth as possible, you can book a spot on one of Charles' rocket launches over at celestis.com. This episode was produced by Ali Graham and Francesca Fiorentini. Jordan Bailey is our lead producer. Production support from Camille Peterson. I'm your host, Utkar Shambutkar. Sarah Nix is executive editor. Greta Cohn is executive producer. Kesla Childers and Greg Lubin are executive producers for Powder Keg. Our USG audio team includes Josh Block, Jessica Grimshaw, Jennifer Sears, Lauren Rackow, Daniel Welsh, and Craig Bloom. Mixing and sound design by Nocturnal Sound. Production assistance from Greta Weber and Maura Waltz. This is a USG audio podcast in collaboration with Transmitter Media and Powder Keg. For more information, go to our website, usgaudio.com.